Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, scientists have discovered a power source for DNA computers, a new species of carnivorous dinosaur from South America has been uncovered, a possible new mineral has been found on Mars, and much more. Our top story this week is a paper that's been published documenting how scientists have discovered a potentially reliable power source for DNA computers. These microscopic biological machines are capable of performing calculations at the nanoscale, utilising the natural interactions between DNA molecules as opposed to silicon chips powered by electricity. The way this works is by having single strands of DNA as inputs, which then combine with each other in specific ways as the computations take place, and the resulting molecules act as the outputs. The concept of DNA computers has existed for some time, first proposed in 1994, and since then various potential applications have been suggested, including as a data storage alternative, as DNA molecules can encode data and package it much more densely than conventional storage media. Another possible future application could be in self-diagnosing medicine, where DNA computing might be used to diagnose or even treat diseases within the body. In the early 2000s, scientists were also able to use DNA as fuel to drive nanomechanical devices and catalytic reactions. However, researchers have so far struggled to find a sustainable fuel source for these synthetic biological machines, as DNA circuits tend to operate only once before stopping, and no equivalent of an electrical power supply to sustain these computations has yet been identified. The new research proposes such a fuel source. Heat. By creating DNA circuits and cycling the temperature within their system, researchers discovered they could switch the molecular systems from states of equilibrium to out of equilibrium states within minutes. Effectively, they found a way to recharge the biological machines. They demonstrated that complex logical circuits and neural networks built with DNA molecules could be recharged multiple times when the temperature was cycled allowing at least 16 rounds of computation before the DNA degrades too much. This is an impressive breakthrough, especially given the ease of accessing heat and the recharge process leaves behind virtually no additional chemical waste, according to the authors. Although still in early stages, with DNA circuits tested under controlled laboratory conditions, the technology shows considerable promise. Other researchers agree that heat is an interesting kind of power source for DNA computing, but argue that molecules such as ATP, the energy provider in living cells, would be better for powering such machines. It is some fantastic stuff that really does sound like another sci-fi technology, but one that appears to be getting closer to reality and practical use. Hopefully, more researchers will be able to build upon this proof of concept, and it'll be exciting to see where this work might lead. Before we discuss other news, we wanted to pay tribute to the incredible Jane Goodall, the world-renowned British primatologist best known for her studies and observations of chimpanzees. On October the 1st, last Wednesday, she sadly passed away at the age of 91. Jane Goodall was an inspiration to people worldwide and, personally, quite a big hero of Ben's. Her work with chimpanzees fundamentally changed our outlook on non-human animals. It also quite literally changed how we define what a human is, since she was the first to document that these primates create and use tools, something that before the 1960s was thought to be a uniquely human ability and therefore was used as one of the defining features of our species. She was also a passionate advocate for animal rights, establishing the Jane Goodall Institute in 1997 and promoting education about conservation science by creating the Roots and Shoots program in 1991 to encourage young people to get involved. In addition, she was a genuinely brilliant science communicator, inspiring people to care about her work and wildlife through the stories she shared. Jane Goodall will be missed, but 
there's no doubt that her legacy will inspire generations to come and the work of her organizations will carry on. Up next, we have a couple of new dinosaur species to talk about this week. First up, a new species of predatory theropod dinosaur from Argentina has been named. It's called Vitasauria colozacani, and it lived about 80 million years ago during the late Cretaceous. It's a kind of theropod called an abelosaurid, a group that became highly successful in the southern continent during the Cretaceous, and which generally have very robust, short and tall skulls. One of the most famous examples would be Carnotaurus. Vitasaura is known from fossil material comprising a couple of vertebrae, parts of the hip bones, and various other bits and pieces. Interestingly, though it's from Argentina, it wasn't discovered in Patagonia, where most other abelosaurids found in South America come from. Instead, Vitasaura comes from the northwest of the country, expanding the known range of these dinosaurs and being the first named theropod found in the Cretaceous of La Roja province. The paleontologists analyzed the evolutionary relationships of this new species, but found that the interrelationships of abelosaurids are poorly resolved. So, it's hoped that more discoveries from this region of Argentina might help scientists to better understand the evolution of these marvelous dinosaurs. Our other new dinosaur species of the week is a species of herbivorous, so-called duckbill dinosaur, a new kind of hadrosaur. Specifically, it's a member of the Sorolifene subfamily and lived about 75 million years ago in what is now New Mexico during the late Cretaceous. Named Ashislosaurus wimani, it's known from a partial skull that displays various unique anatomical features and there are several other partial skeletons known from the same geological formation that potentially represent more example of the species, though that's not yet certain. Ashislosaurus has been found to be closely related to a geological younger hadrosaur species called Narshoabetosaurus, seeming to suggest that these dinosaurs were part of a previously unrecognized lineage of flat-headed Sorolophene hadrosaurs. As such, the discovery of this new species sheds more light on the remarkable evolution of these fascinating dinosaurs, indicating that they were even more diverse than previously realized. This week, there's another new species of prehistoric reptile, a kind of Jurassic lizard with a strange mixture of features resembling snakes, geckos, and even monitor lizards. Named Brognathia elgolensis, it was found in 167 million year old mid-Jurassic rocks in Scotland and is based on a disarticulated partial skeleton that nevertheless preserves some important features. This creature had snake-like teeth and jaws, but its overall body proportions were more similar to a monitor lizard, and it also displays relatively primitive characteristics similar to early branching lizard groups such as geckos. It has a true mosaic of features and has been classified into a newly recognized family of prehistoric lizards called Parviraptoridae, alongside several other poorly known species. The Parviraptorids could be quite significant in understanding how snakes evolved, as some of the evolutionary trees produced in this study place them near the base of the snake lineage. However, the scientists get several conflicting results, and in other analyses, the parviraptorids are closer to other lizards, meaning they may have convergently evolved snake-like teeth and jaws. It's certainly an important discovery, and the parviraptorids seem to be a very interesting group, illustrating that there's still so much to learn about the origins of these iconic animals. An interesting paper was published a couple of weeks ago in the journal Galaxies that we missed, but it's come to our attention now, and we wanted to talk about it because it relates to a couple of other stories we've talked about on Seven Days of Science before. Back in the summer of 2023, a paper was published by an astrophysicist at the University of Ottawa that challenged the commonly used and accepted cosmological model, the Lambda CDM model. In doing so, they predicted the universe was billions of years older than we currently think. In 2024, another paper published by this same author said that this new cosmic model dispelled the need to find dark matter. Well, the paper published a couple of weeks ago posits that both dark matter and dark energy are illusions created by varying cosmological constants. All these papers combine a couple of hypotheses about the universe, one of them being the idea that cosmological constants aren't as constant as we think. 
and can change very slowly over vast periods of time. The other is the tired light theory that basically says that light slows down over similarly vast periods of time. This new paper says that it is these processes that create the illusion of the universe's expansion accelerating and the mysterious forces that scientists usually attribute to the existence of currently invisible dark matter. Whilst these ideas solve a great many problems plaguing the physics community, some of the science is currently disputed and not yet readily accepted. For example, the tired light theory is no longer seen as an acceptable idea, having been seemingly proved false many years ago. Science is a shifting world though, so it will be interesting to see where this researcher goes next with his new maths. In other space news, we're back at science's favourite planet with another update from Mars, with the possible discovery of a new mineral. A study published in the journal Nature Communications this week may have solved a mystery from 2010 when an instrument aboard NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter picked up readings from a mineral that appeared not to exist. Or, at least, it is a mineral yet to be discovered. Discovered inside an impact crater, the data was unable to be translated into a blueprint for a new mineral because of the Martian atmosphere affecting the data that the orbiter received. To become usable, the data had to be heavily worked on, and the scientists were eventually able to make it workable with the help of deep learning AI. Using what they had learned, the researchers recreated the mineral to work out its compound, calling it ferric hydrooxysulfate. Now, unfortunately, we cannot yet announce the discovery of a new mineral because to be officially recognised as such, it must be found on Earth. Now it's been created in a laboratory environment, however, scientists will be able to find places around our planet that mimic the characteristics required for its formation. Hopefully, we'll be able to come back to this story in the future to make a happy announcement. Continuing with the space news now, as a study published in the Astrophysical Journal Letters has detailed the extraordinary growth of a free-floating exoplanet that is not orbiting any star. Sitting at between 5 to 10 times the mass of Jupiter, this exoplanet is growing faster than any planet previously recorded, taking in dust and gas from its surroundings and adding to its mass at a rate of 6 billion tonnes every second. Another particularly unusual thing about the growth of this exoplanet is that it's not steady and has fluctuated over time. Observations made by a variety of instruments, including ESO's Very Large Telescope and multiple instruments on the James Webb Space Telescope, showed a surprisingly varied accretion rate and have astronomers wondering whether or not the line between planet and star is closer than what we previously believed. Previously, magnetic activity had only driven the massive growth of cosmic bodies in stars before, but it seems to have played a part in the growth of this exoplanet as well. The new discovery of such processes can leave us to wonder what kind of planets could be out there floating alone in space. Finally for the news this week, the impact of deep sea mining on our marine environment has once again come under scrutiny. A recent study found that 30 species of sharks, rays and chimeras have habitat ranges that overlap with areas targeted for potential deep sea mining. The researchers assessed the effects of three main types of deep sea mining, mining for polymetallic nodules, which are located on the abyssal seafloor, polymetallic sulphides, which are found near hydrothermal vents, and cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts, which are found on seamounts. All 30 species were affected by discharge plume scenarios, though the overlap decreased with depth and no overlap was observed for nodule mining on the abyssal plain. Additionally, 25 of the 30 species would be at risk from seafloor disruption as mining activities could destroy critical habitats, damage seabed nurseries for egg-laying species, and reduce prey availability. This research highlights the potential for deep-sea mining to severely impact fragile and poorly understood ecosystems that many species depend on. The study's authors have suggested measures to help minimise these impacts, but the most effective way to protect these deep sea species may simply be to leave their world untouched. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science.
Be sure to email us at 7dos.stories at gmail.com if you have any research you'd like to see us cover, or if you want to let us know how we can improve the show. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Kang Yin, Chippy Chippy Chappa Chappa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Bather, Deanna Hernandez, Drav Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, Joran Joydevic, John French, Joseph Ree, Josh Lambert, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Prieprajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Petrikas, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, Tracy Merrifield, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Don't know if you heard my tummy rumble then. I need to have some lunch.